Chairman, thank you very much. And thanks to all of you uh, again for inviting me to your fantastic conference and to your gorgeous country. It's a great honor to be in Colombia. So we have a 62-year-old man who is admitted to our emergency department with a two-week history of epigastric pain and mild nausea. Took him a while to come in, didn't it? A one-day history of intermittent melanoma, though, starts to get even more concerning, and you find out the patient actually also has complaints of lightheadedness, however, denies any sort of vomiting, hematemesis, or otherwise. And there's a medical history that includes type 2 diabetes mellitus for the past six years, along with hypertension for twice that long, and coronary artery disease with angina, which required the placement of a coronary stent just six weeks ago for a 90% uh, osteo lesion of the left anterior descending coronary artery. Current medications include metformin, metoprolol, hydrochlorothiazide, 81 milligrams uh, of aspirin a day, and clopidogrel. Remember, this patient had a coronary stent place just six weeks ago. On your examination, the patient has a normal temperature but is tachycardic at a rate of 120 and regular with a respiratory rate that's normal and a blood pressure that's somewhat hypotensive, supine 105 over 78 millimeters of mercury, and then upon standing, obviously orthostatic at 85 over 60. On your exam, the abdomen is normal, but the rectal uh, de exam demonstrates uh, melana and is, in fact, uh, hemocult positive. Antithrombotic agents uh, are used more and more for a number of reasons, not the least of which because there are interventions such as cardiac stents uh, that lead to better health, uh, uh, a better quality of life uh, and prolongation of life for many patients, but also because we are all living longer and are on the face of the earth longer uh, and therefore uh, develop maladies of various sorts that require and benefit from antithrombotic agents. These, of course, include atrial fibrillation as well as the acute coronary syndrome you just heard described deep venous thromboses, hypercoagulable states, and endoprostheses, such as the one we were just talking about. The most common site of bleeding in these patients who are on oral anticoagulation is the GI tract, which is why we're talking about this today. And antithrombotic agents can be thought of as including two large groups of medication. Antithrombotic agents include both anticoagulants as well as antiplatelet agents. Anticoagulants include warfarin, otherwise called Coumadin, uh, as well as heparin, also including the low molecular weight variety of heparin. Whereas antiplatelet agents are actually manifold and they include both aspirin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Remember that aspirin causes uh, permanent dysfunction of platelets. As well as thionopyridines, which we see used more and more, including not only the clopidogrel, which this patient that we described is on, but also ticlopidine. There are also glycoprotein 2B3A receptor inhibitors. So when we consider these antithrombotic drugs, one issue that impacts us in, as endoscopists is their duration of action. And as you can see, unfortunately, the patient that we describe is on the drugs that have their effect for the longest duration. While the effect of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs uh, can vary, uh, and warfarin can last from three to five days, which is why uh, in patients with relatively lower risks of thrombotic or thromboembolic phenomena, you may very well uh, choose to discontinue warfarin uh, for about a week prior to the procedure, perform your procedure, and then restart it right away. The uh, drugs we just considered in this patient, aspirin, lasts 10 days, 
and the effect of thienopyridines approaches that at three to seven days, which is why we frequently stop at least thienopyridines, if not aspirin, for about a week before undertaking elective endoscopic procedures. The antidote, of course, not surprisingly, but I think it's easy to forget this, which is why I included this table, uh, in, includes infusing platelets because, as we were just saying, these medications disable platelets uh, and they do it permanently. As a result, the antidote would be then to give platelets which are still functioning normally. There are some important details to consider, of course, which includes the urgency of the endoscopic procedure. Because no decision is more basic than that where you ask yourself, do I really need to perform this endoscopy now or can it wait? If it's a screening procedure or it's some indolent symptom, you obviously don't need to perform the procedure while the patient is on anticoagulants or on antiplatelet agents. Therefore, you may do well to wait in such situations. Unfortunately, I don't think uh, orthostasis presenting with melana in a patient with coronary artery disease uh, is going to be that sort of elective situation. Other things to consider include the risk of bleeding due to antithrombotic therapy itself, the risk of bleeding iatrogenically caused by the procedure that you undertake while the patient is on antithrombotic therapy if you choose to perform endoscopy while the patient is on antithrombotic therapy. And that may well be uh, a, uh, a very wise decision to go ahead. You may actually find it very reasonable to endoscope some patients in some situations while they are on antibiotic therapy. We'll discuss that in some detail in a moment. Alternative, less invasive studies may be more appropriate uh, if you don't need to undertake something more invasive. So perhaps uh, radiologic, non-invasive radiologic imaging or a video capsule endoscopy, both of which have essentially no uh, iatrogenic risk of causing bleeding. Uh, if those sorts of studies may be effective for your diagnostic workup, then you may well want to consider them instead of undertaking endoscopy if the patient cannot or should not come off of uh, antithrombotic agents. And then, of course, potential thrombotic and thromboembolic events that may occur if you choose to discontinue antithrombotic therapy. Admittedly, in the patient that we were just discussing, this is a patient who is only six weeks out from the placement of a coronary stent. Many cardiologists keep their patients on anti-thrombotic uh, agents for one full year before discontinuing them, one full year after the placement of that coronary stent. We're only six weeks into 52 weeks in a year. If you withdraw that medication, and this was a, a, uh, an LAD lesion actually, that patient may have a myocardial infarction, uh, may go into even cardiogenic shock or develop a lethal dysrhythmia and die. They're much more likely to survive unscathed a gastrointestinal bleeding episode induced by your scope your therapeutic intervention or otherwise than they are to survive a cardiac disaster. So those are some caveats to consider. And of course also the severity of these sequelae as I was just saying and also the severity of bleeding that may result from procedures that you may undertake, particularly if they fall into the category of high risk endoscopic uh, interventions. So then this leads us to exactly that issue with this patient. This is a very, very important resource which I would like to point you to, which is the ASGE or American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopies guidelines, their most recent guidelines published three years ago uh, on anti uh, uh, thrombotic agents uh, in the setting of gastrointestinal bleeding. And as you can see, when we consider procedure risk for bleeding, we consider 
higher risk procedures versus low risk procedures. And none of these are surprising to you because you consider these, many of these day by day as you perform, say, diagnostic colonoscopy instead of hot snare polypectomy, or you perform ERCP diagnostically as opposed to ERCP with sphincterotomy. So as you can see, we're talking about the potential to undertake not only diagnostic EGD in our patient with epigastric pain, melana, and clear uh, clinical evidence of probably upper gastrointestinal bleeding, but we must also be prepared for the eventuality that we may need to treat active bleeding or we may need to treat stigmata uh, at high risk of re-bleeding and those interventions would be considered endoscopic hemostasis and that cat is categorized as a high risk endoscopic procedure. Unfortunately, we have the combination of a high risk endoscopic procedure with a patient who is at high risk for suffering a thrombotic event if he is taken off of his antithrombotic agents. And as you can see, this patient falls into that high risk for thrombotic event category because he had a stent placed in the coronary artery less than one year ago. So what is known is that there are no clinical trials demonstrating an increased incidence of bleeding in patients undergoing EGD or colonoscopy with or without biopsy, so essentially low-risk procedures, while they are on aspirin or on clopidogrel. Lauren Gerson published uh, over a decade ago a series of 104 patients who had undergone 171 such low-risk endoscopic procedures while on therapeutic doses of anticoagulation this time with warfarin, EGD or colonoscopy, and she found that none of these patients experienced bleeding that was attributable to the endoscopic procedure, whether a biopsy was done or not. Mitch Schiffman, uh, a long time ago, in 1994, described in GIE in his retrospective series that there is a less than 1% increased risk of bleeding uh, post polypectomy in uh, 694 patients that were uh, on anticoagulants. However, this has not been subsequently replicated in other retrospective series, which is why I don't have any newer data to show you than something that's embarrassingly 18 years old. There are no randomized controlled trials for polypectomy on antithrombotic agents. There are small series where hemostatic clip application and loop application demonstrate low uh, rates of healing or rather low rates of bleeding with uh, polypectomy on patients who are on warfarin. So I think it, it all makes sense. When antithrombotic uh, therapy is temporary, so when somebody, say, has a deep venous thrombosis and a lower extremity is a good example of that, or is presently on anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation, which is uh, likely to be reversed with cardioversion in the future, Elective procedures really should be delayed until after the anticoagulation is discontinued by the cardiologist or the hematologist that's following the patient. A coronary stent patient is an excellent example. Significant risk of spontaneous stent occlusion, we were just saying, causing coronary, uh, acute coronary syndrome and death. The need to stop and reverse agents really, really needs to be individualized because these are two completely different situations. I think it's worthwhile to turn to the American Heart Association and American uh, College of Cardiology guidelines published six years ago, uh, which looked at patients on warfarin with a low risk of thrombosis, just like we were talking about DVT, uh, or a uh, patient with uh, atrial fibrillation who's likely to be cardioverted uh, uh, or uh, uh, a similar patient that warfarin should, uh, should be held without bridge therapy. This is fairly easy in an elective procedure uh, like this. Just stop it, uh, wait several days to a week, and then go ahead with your procedure because the risk of that patient uh, developing uh, a thrombotic or thromboembolic event 
although not zero, is low. And for those of us who've been performing uh, endoscopy in these sorts of patients for many, many years, we've all probably experienced at least one patient, given this statistic, who has actually unfortunately suffered a thrombotic or thromboembolic event as a, a result of stopping uh, the warfarin. And I certainly have had a patient who had a stroke as a result of that, which was very sad uh, and a great loss to that patient. Uh, as well as uh, to my confidence for a while. These things impact us personally uh, as good physicians, which is why you want to make sure always that the, not only was the procedure indicated, uh, but also that it was necessary to perform it then rather than waiting. If it's elective, ask yourself how elective it is and ask yourself if it's elective enough to wait until the need for the anticoagulation uh, has passed. Restarting antibiotic therapy, or rather antithrombotic therapy, unfortunately, I have no consensus statement to provide you with in terms of the optimal timing of restarting. I think the benefits of immediate reinitiation of therapy have to be weighed against any increased risk of hemorrhage there might be from starting it a little too early, so to speak. And so this is going to depend largely on details that are specific to the procedure and the interventions that you perform during your procedure, as well as the patient's circumstances, which may even uh, include social circumstances that they may have in addition to medical ones. Many patients uh, with acute coronary syndrome with a recently placed vascular stent, just like our patient, um, receive more than one antithrombotic agent in this day and age, and it's usually aspirin and a thionopyridine. It's sobering to know that one to three percent of these patients will develop gastrointestinal bleeding actually during their index hospitalization while they're having uh, that stent placed. These patients will have a four to seven-fold increased risk of in-hospital mortality, the risk of complications with an EGD in the setting of an acute cardiac event is uh, one to two percent. Not surprisingly, most of these in this series published over a decade ago were the result of peptic ulcer disease. Now, as for urgent endoscopy on these sorts of patients, there is a decision analysis that was published just three years ago that I want to call your attention to. These are patients undergoing EGD actually prior to cardiac catheterization to evaluate GI bleeding in the setting of an acute myocardial infarction. EGD was actually demonstrated to be beneficial in patients presenting with an overt GI bleed in the setting of an acute coronary syndrome with an overall reduction in death, as you see uh, noted there, of, uh, from 600 down to uh, just south of 100 per 10,000 patients. However, this uh, uh, was not uh, a benefit that was demonstrated in patients who didn't present with acute overt GI bleeding, but those that presented with occult GI bleeding actually did not demonstrate this benefit. In that uh, ASGE guideline, there's actually a nice uh, algorithm uh, that is uh, available for you to look at. Uh, and you can easily pull this up online at the ASGE's website under their clinical practice guidelines. And these uh, very flow charts uh, are right there online for you available anytime. So there's no reason not to avail yourself uh, to this uh, compendium of expert opinion. And what this chart drives home to me as the main message is that Aspirin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in the setting of elective endoscopy, which is what we're talking about in this particular uh, flow chart, aspirin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are always okay. Whether it's a procedure for low or high risk of procedure-related bleeding, uh, combined with a low thromboembolic risk, there's no need for you uh, to consider uh, discontinuing the aspirin or non-steroidal. The patient can stay on it if it is a high-risk procedure but low risk of thromboembolism. If there is a high-risk procedure 
and a high thromboembolic risk, you're definitely going to want to, con uh, to keep that patient on aspirin. So here you can consider continuing it or consider it discontinuing it, but knowing that aspirin appears to be safe, you're probably going to continue it. And that's a big change from the way we used to practice 10 years ago. Thienopyridines, like the clopidogrel that, that our patient is also on, is a completely different story. In a patient with low risk of bleeding from your procedure, obviously if it's safe, it is safe to continue it. So with our patient, if all you are sure you're going to do is go in and perform diagnostic EGD to see whether there's bleeding or not, or to stratify the risk of rebleeding. So let's say you say we have our patient we were just talking about. You're going to perform a diagnostic endoscopy with the hopes that what you're going to find is a clean-based ulcer. There's no reason why you can't do that and still keep the patient on aspirin and clopidogrel. However, if you're thinking about performing a hemostatic intervention, which you know is categorized as a high-risk procedure, a procedure at high risk for inducing iatrogenic bleeding. That puts you on this side of this algorithm. If there's a low thromboembolic risk, then go ahead and discontinue the drug. But to be effective, you have to discontinue it for a week. And in somebody presenting with hemodynamic issues uh, and melana, you're not going to be able to wait a week what you'd end up having to do is to infuse platelets, which may actually be uh, dangerous in a patient that is on this side of the flow diagram. High risk uh, procedure combined with a high thromboembolic risk, such as our patient who recently had a coronary stent placed. Okay. Now, right now, we're talking about elective procedures, so it's a little bit different story. With an elective procedure, with a high uh, risk of procedural bleeding and a high thromboembolic risk, what our guidelines tell us is to consider postponing the procedure, just like we've said a couple of times earlier in this talk. Ask yourself in an elective situation, can this procedure really wait until the cardiologist has said, okay, enough, we're done with the clopidogrel? If so, wait, don't do the procedure right now. If you have to do the procedure right now, then it's probably not an elective endoscopic procedure. It's an urgent one. And this is where our patient uh, is categorized. This is urgent endoscopy because it's a patient with hemodynamic compromise and a patient uh, who presents with melana. What do you do about the aspirin in that setting? Well, we, if we're only going to take a look you can continue the aspirin. If you're only going to do diagnostic endoscopy, you can continue the uh, clopidogrel. However, if you're thinking about even the possibility of going in to perform therapy, that's a patient at, uh, who's going to undergo a potential high-risk endoscopic procedure and, ha and you know has high thrombotic risk because it's a recently placed coronary stent. You need to continue that aspirin. Don't discontinue the aspirin. And what about the clopidogrel? If it's just going to be a look and not a therapy, it's okay to continue. But if you're thinking about doing therapy, that goes on this side of the flow diagram. And our patient has high thromboembolic risk because it's a recently placed coronary stent. Stop. Call your cardiologist. Call the patient's cardiologist first. At that point, before you're going to do your endoscopy, unless you're promising that all you're going to do is go in and do diagnostic endoscopy, get a cardiology consultation and get a formal consultation. It's important medically to get a consultation. It's important medical legally to obtain a formal consultation and go on the recommendation of your cardiologist. If, unlike our patient, the patient has been uh, six months out from the placement of a coronary stent or eight months out, the cardiologist may tell you, well, you know what, I was planning to keep the patient on the clopidogrel for one year, but given this bleeding and you're telling me it might be serious, uh, I might tell you you can stop it. But remember, we just said that if you stop it, the patient is still going to have 
the effect of that clopidogrel for another seven to 10 days, what can you do? You could certainly give platelets, but you would never want to do that with the blessing, without the blessing of your cardiologist through a formal consultation. Or you may decide to go ahead and take the risk that you may induce bleeding because you're pretty good at stopping bleeding. You know, to stop bleeding at least acutely with mechanical means like a hemostatic clip, you don't have to have intact platelet function and you don't have to have an intact uh, 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 coagulation cascade. For durability of that treatment, you may, but within seven days, the thionopyridine effect is going to be gone. So you might actually end up okay just going ahead and treating the patient. But I can't underscore enough, this is the point at which you must consult the cardiologist and you're better off doing it before you sedate the patient and perform your endoscopy. And then along with the cardiologist, if you really need to, depending on the patient's circumstances, you may consider discontinuing. So make use of your guidelines. Patients on temporary anticoagulation uh, undergoing endoscopic procedures, you might want to defer them if they're elective. Aspirin and non-steroidals may be continued for all endoscopic procedures. Elective procedures should be deferred in patients with recently placed vascular stents or acute coronary syndrome until antithrombotic therapy has been given for the minimum recommended time, and your cardiologist will tell you what that minimum recommended time is. Clopidogrel and ticlodipine may be continued for low-risk procedures such as diagnostic endoscopy, but they need to be discontinued for a week or more before high-risk procedures unless absolutely necessary, in which case you may use mechanical means for hemostasis. And remember to consult the cardiologist in these situations. So going back to our patient, uh, you know what the profile is. What would you do? Thank you very much.